And good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Carlson. I'm Strategic Initiatives Director with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Practical Farmers of Iowa is a member organization uh, located in the state of Iowa, but we have memberships all across uh, the Corn Belt uh, in many of the surrounding states and across the United States and even some international. Um, we uh, pride ourselves on helping farmers save a lot of time and money when they add new practices. And today's webinar is really specifically about ways that you could save on cover crops and maybe some of those reasons to spend as you want to add that practice to your farm and take it to the, new le the next level. So across Iowa, we know that with the Census of Ag data back in 2012, to 2017 that Iowa had an increase in cover crop acreage of 156%. And that sounds like a really big number and very impressive increase in cover crop acres. And it is, I don't wanna uh, belittle the amount of work that farmers have put in adding this practice and making it work on their farm. Um, but if we look at what that number is, um, that absolute number, we're still only a tenth of the way there in total acres that we would need in Iowa to dramatically improve water quality. We need about 13 to 16 million acres or every other field <clears throat> in a winter cover crop. So there's many reasons why we might not see a cover crop on every other field today. And some of that comes back to that return on investment, that economics or that partial budget um, that my colleague Rebecca Clay is gonna go over today. So I wanted to mention uh, where some of the data comes from. We've been running a number of cover crop cost share programs with a large number of partners uh, across uh, Iowa and across the Corn Belt. Beck, if you could share the first slide. And I wanted to give a shout out to many of those partners who have invested in practical farmers and invested in farmers to make changes on their farm. So across the Corn Belt, you can see uh, the circle on the map there of where many of our programs are located. They're not just in Iowa, like I said earlier. And these are a smattering of the partners who have been investing at the farm gate with farmers trying to add cover crops and also small grains uh, to their fields. So we're really uh, grateful for their support and we hope that they can continue to support their customers um, all the way to their fields. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Rebecca Clay, Strategic Initiatives Coordinator with Practical Farmers of Iowa to uh, tell us a little bit more about what we found uh, through our cover crop study today. Go ahead, Becca. Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this virtual coffee and uh, to chat about cover crop, crop economics. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Becca Clay, and I'm the Strategic Initiatives Agro Agronomy Coordinator at Practical Farmers of Iowa. And last winter, I was chatting with somebody who had been doing cover crops for a number of years and really liked the practice, but he was saying that he wasn't really sure that he was gonna do the practice again next fall because uh, he was having a hard time seeing uh, any return on his ROI from the cover crops, uh, from the money that he's investing in the cover crops. And this is a sentiment that we hear pretty often at Practical Farmers, especially new folks. They're wondering how can we make this practice pay uh, if, if we don't get cost share in the future. And so this is something that we wanted, we at Practical Farmers wanted to explore, especially because we know that some farmers actually are making the practice pay. Um, and some farmers are using cover crops in a way that are at least ROI neutral or, um, or sometimes even a net positive practice in their pocketbook. And so to figure this out um, specifically, we uh, went directly to uh, the farmers to, to kind of figure out this question. So. Um, we deployed a survey to cover crop cost share participants in central Iowa. And I want to state, of course, that we're only presenting their data in aggregate. We try to keep that as private as possible um, just to protect the identity of the farmer who is, who is responding. And so this survey asked for information on how the use of cover crops are changing the cost of their production, their crop uh, production practices. Um, it asked on if they were getting any additional revenue, uh, signal application costs. So you can see just a sampling of some of the questions that we were asking in, uh, on, on the slide on the right side. And then after we collected all of these survey responses and kind of sorted through them, we conducted a partial budget analysis to better understand the net impact of cover crops. And so if you're not already familiar with what a partial budget is, I can go over um, kind of the bare bones of it. It's essentially an analysis of the financial impact of any given practice. And so 
we added up all the positive and all the negative changes from farm revenue and farm costs uh, from cover crops. Um, and I also just want to say that for this study, we actually did not include any cost share funding, um, and we also didn't include any changes to yield. Uh, the reasons that we didn't include changes to yield was because we know that many people often cover crop their uh, lowest yielding fields to start with, and so if there were differences in yield, it was not attributable to, often it's not attributable to the cover crop, it's rather just um, a characteristic of the field itself. And so beyond seeding the cover crops, you might be wondering uh, how are people adding costs or, or reducing costs or um, adding revenue or reducing revenue. And so I'll go over a couple examples of some innovative producers who uh, have been changing some of their practices here. So that, uh, for the most part, we found that most people are not changing their practices at all. Um, however, some innovative farmers uh, are changing their practices in a more significant way. Uh, for example, Jack Boyer, who uh, I believe might be on this webinar, I'll have to check the participant list in a bit. Uh, Jack farms near Rhinebeck, Iowa, and he's been using cover crops for about six years on a field, and he had the thought of, you know, if I'm improving my soil health and I'm saving this nitrogen from my water bodies, then maybe that nitrogen could be available to my corn crop. And so Jack did an on-farm experiment with uh, practical Farmers Cooperators Program, and he reduced his nitrogen fertilizer by 50 pounds an acre by skipping side dressing on these uh, strip trials. And he, Jack actually observed no negative uh, yield impact uh, that was statistically significant. And so this, this saved him $26 an acre between both the nitrogen fertilizer uh, and also the side dress application cost. So, um, just keep that in mind, $26 an acre is significant and, you know, approaching kind of the cost of what uh, it, it takes to feed and apply cover crop seeds. Another innovative farmer is Sam Bennett of Galva, Iowa, who's also been able to cut uh, production costs of his cash crop, uh, specifically his soybeans, using a cover crop. And so Sam experimented with uh, using a typical herbicide program and also trialed emitting some uh, residual herbicide and so no, saw no yield impact. And his herbicide savings were $16 an acre uh, on that product reduction. And he also anecdotally has told us that he's seen a lot less weed pressure in those fields. Um, and that part, again, I think is just really worth highlighting. You know, $16 an acre on, it, on its own is significant. Um, but uh, Sam's sentiment of seeing less weed pressure is something that we hear from other farmers as well. Um, and I think this is going to be especially important as we see um, additional uh, uh, I guess species and rates of species that are developing resistant uh, to herbicide products, such as the ones that we're already seeing, uh, water hemp, mare's tail, giant ragweed. And so cover crops are going to be a really important tool for controlling these weeds as our herbicide products lose efficacy on controlling these, these crop pests. So I've gone over some of the ways that people are altering uh, the cost of production just so that you can get a, a better idea of, you know, a couple ideas and how uh, that all fits into a partial budget. And now I'd just like to go over some of the other changes in cost of cover crops. Um, as to be expected, the biggest expense of cover cropping was seed and application of seed. And so we plotted this on a scatter plot to show that there was a huge amount of variation and how much people are spending on seed and application, um, as you can see in the graph. And Sarah, why don't you go ahead and uh, start the poll for this one now. Um, so we're doing a couple polls. I hope you can still, hopefully you're not seeing just the poll online. We're doing polls just because, you know, we can't be together in person, and so we're trying to make this as interactive as possible with the format that we've got going. Um, so the scatter plot isn't the most intuitive to understand. And so let me break it down for you really briefly. Uh, each of the blue dots represents one of the 251 farmers who responded to our survey. And on the x-axis down here is a cover crop seed cost. So, um, you know, if they're closer to this left side, they're spending less on cover crop seed versus if they're um, on this right side, they're spending more on cover crop seed. And in terms of seed cost, um, I highlighted kind of the mean and median range here. Uh, folks were spending about $14 to $15 an acre on seed. And then on the x or excuse me, on the y axis, on the vertical axis here, uh, we plotted application costs. 
and we found that the, the mean and median for this was around about $15 an acre as well. And this is highlighted in orange and started in orange. Um, and so what all this means is that on average producers are participating in our cost, uh, the producers who are participating in our cost share programs are spending around $29 an acre on cover crops. And so we could definitely lower that uh, or uh, you know, find other ways to kind of recoup those costs in other ways. So I'm going to end polling now. I think you guys can uh, hopefully see the results. So the question was, have you ever calculated your own seed and application costs? And uh, about 50% of people are saying, yes, they've done their own. So they didn't necessarily need our help on that. That's excellent. Um, a few people said no. Uh, and a few other people said not yet. Um, we have a couple folks who are brand new to cover crops and then also some people who aren't farming. So thank you for um, participating in, in that quick poll for us. Um, all right. So whether or not you've, oops, that's an extra slide. Whether or not you've uh, calculated your seed and seeding costs in the past, um, we just wanted to go over you know, some ways, even if you think that you're not spending very much on it, maybe ways that you could reduce the amount that you're spending on seed and application costs. Um, and, you know, $29 doesn't really sound like much uh, to me, at least. Uh, but when we extrapolate this over many acres, it can actually be a lot of money. And so, you know, we're working alongside producers to kind of figure out um, ways that they can save on seed and application costs. Um, and uh, if they're not saving, if they're spending a little bit more money, how they can best utilize uh, those, that application uh, in seed costs. So uh, to kind of go over the format that I'm using here, we underlined at the right some of the ways to save, and I just tried to highlight some examples of what might be going on there. And just to remind you, um, application costs average around $15 an acre. And so one of the first and easiest ways that we can reduce costs is to save on application costs. Um, and one really simple and, or at least it seems simple to me, and uh, effective way to reduce application costs is to add cover crop seed to your fall fertilizer application. Most people are making this path already, and you know, adding that cover crop seed typically costs somewhere between a dollar and five dollars an acre, as opposed to that average application cost of fifteen dollars an acre. I was chatting with somebody the other day that was saying that he gets it for. Uh, gets his cover crop seed added to his fall fertilizer uh, application for $1.50. So, you know, that person's saving $13.5 compared to the average person right off the bat, which is amazing to me. Another way that we can save money on uh, cover crop seed is by growing our own seed. Um, of course, if we're growing our own seed, then we're not losing the extra profit margin to the seed supplier or the seed grower. And perhaps uh, more importantly and additionally, um, it adds a bit of diversity to the rotation. And if we are growing our own seed, then we get the opportunity to grow an early seeded leguminous nitrogen fixing cover crop, which could help us to reduce nitrogen rates to the following corn crop. Um, and so if you're interested in growing your own seed, Practical Farmers has tons of resources on our website. And Sarah and I would also, and Alicia Bauer would also be really happy to chat with you on this. And a third way that uh, folks are able to save on cover crop seed and application costs is to skip the fancy multi-species mixes unless you have really specific plans of grazing or nitrogen fixation. Um, we love diversity in our crop rotations and in our fields, um, but unless we have plans that really require these multi-species mixes, it's typically not worth the money to invest in them. Um, and so some of the exceptions for this, as I mentioned, are if you're planning on grazing, that cover crop, uh, and you want a lot of biomass quickly, multi-species could be a good option for that. Or if you're wanting a nitrogen credit after a small grain crop, but you also want a uh, quick soil coverage, you might do a multi-species cover crop to get that soil covered uh, while your leguminous cover crop is coming in. And then one of the, lo the last ways that we learned to save um, from producers and from our survey is that uh, you can really get more bang for your buck by uh, using cover crop species, uh, species seed that has smaller seed size. So oilseed radishes are really popular right now all across the country, um, but we can get a very similar uh, long tap root structure with the same compaction pan breaking benefits, but with a smaller investment if we can use smaller seeded cover crops. 
Um, so if we're using a smaller seed cover crop, such as rape seed or turnips, something from the brassica, brassica family, which still has a long taproot, um, instead of oilseed radishes, we can reduce the rate of seeding um, to get the same number of plants per acre uh, while still getting the same benefit. So that's a really easy way um, to, to reduce your cost if you want to you know, use something like pillage radishes or oilseed radishes. Um, so less money per acre with the same benefit. Um, now I'd like to move into a couple of reasons why you might actually want to continue spending more on, on your cover crop. Once in a while, it does make a little bit more sense for us to continue to dole out the cash on seed and application. Um, and so we can go over some of the reasons to, to spend on seed and application. For instance, if, as we mentioned, if we plan to graze the cover crop or we want a really consistent stand for weed suppression, it might be worth spending the extra money on additional seed or earlier application methods. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for weed suppression, maybe seeding closer to two bushel an acre instead of one bushel an acre because you'll be able to recoup those costs next year um, in, during your cash crop production. Likewise, if we're seeding a uh, summer cover crop, such as a small grain and seeding something like crimson clover or hairy vetch, we can get a nitrogen credit to the following corn crop and we uh, should also reduce the nitrogen fertilizer rate to the following corn crop. So that's one of the keys. You know, if you're Growing a leguminous cover crop, you really, uh, to get money back from, from the seed of growing that, um, we really need to reduce the nitrogen fertilizer rate to the following year's corn if we want to make that financially work for us. All right, so um, I'll pause there. I, I think I saw some coming in on the chat, but um, I would love to hear from you know producers or practitioners if you guys have any other ideas on ways that we can be saving on seed and application, go ahead and drop those in the chat. Um, we'd really love to hear your thoughts. I'm sure there are tons of things that we haven't thought of. Um, and so um, we'll be sharing those later, later on in the presentation. But for now, I'm going to move on to um, a, an additional set of our results. Um, beyond changing cover crop seed and application costs, we saw that some people are spending additional money on their cover crops when it came to their cash crops. And in this graph, you can see the different ways that people increase the cost of their cash crop production when using cover crops. And each uh, singular bar represents one farmer's response and how much additional money they were spending on cover crops. So for, or on cover crop fields, I should say. So just for example, this lowest blue bar, this is one producer's response who was spending about $30 an acre additionally on, on fertilizer and manure. And so let's just move uh, from the top to the bottom on these results. Um, the green color at the, at the very top shows uh, that four people were spending additional money on tillage after uh, planting cover crops. And um, we really shouldn't be adding additional tillage with cover crops. Um, tillage as a cover crop termination method is one of the least effective methods. And um, yeah, it's just not a necessary practice. So, don't add additional tillage. We don't need to be adding additional tillage with cover crops. Um, the peach color is uh, where folks are spending additional money on uh, herbicide product. And this navy blue color is where people are spending additional money on herbicide passes. Um, and this is kind of a common misconception that you need to be adding additional herbicide product. However, we know that uh, additional herbicide product is typically not necessary for cover crop termination. And we just really need to be using the best practices, such as terminating the cover crop on warm, sunny days when the cover crop is actively growing and uptaking um, that herbicide product. And then the last blue uh, set of three down here that we have is uh, folks that are spending more money on fertilizer of cover on fertilizer following cover crops. And um, we do know that adjusting the time, uh, the timing of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, especially with cereal rye or some sort of overwintering uh, cereal crop ahead of corn, uh, is really important. It's, it's good to adjust the timing of our nitrogen fertilizer. Um, we typically want to include a little bit more nitrogen fertilizer at planting to bridge the gap from uh, when that uh, cereal cover crop is starting to break down and might be tying up and immobilizing some of our nitrogen that um, ought to be available to our corn seedlings. Um, however, if we're applying an additional uh, 30, 40 pounds of nitrogen at planting, we should be able to take that 30, 40 pounds off of um, our nitrogen rates at another time. So taking it off of our fall fertilizer rate 
or taking it off of our, our side directory. And then to counter this, um, we also observed people that are spending less money on corn and soy production with cover crops. Um, and so these, these are kind of the folks that we really want to be learning from. How are they, you know, changing their practices to make this work better for them? And so, Sarah, you can go ahead and share the second poll now. And as, uh, as you guys are participating in that second poll, I'm going to move uh, through the results from the top to the bottom. Um, okay, so same colors as last time. In the green, we can see that folks were, um, some people were emitting a tillage pass which on average was saving about $17.5. Uh, and so cover crops and no-till or cover crops and reduced till work really well together. And that's one of the easiest ways that we can recoup the cost of the seed and application is by, if we're still using tillage, um, by reducing a tillage path. And in the peach color, we can see that uh, folks who are leaving out herbicide products, um, quite a few folks, 20, uh, 24 people were leaving out herbicide products with an average value of uh, almost $11. And then on the same subject, this uh, navy blue color is when folks are saving money on herbicide pass, passes. And um, again, the average for this was about uh, $7.25. So um, quite a, some of the folks that are in the navy blue on this one were also in the peach. And so, you know, if you're getting uh, $7.25 plus $11, that's um, $18 or so that you're again, able to recoup some of those uh, seed and application costs. And then on the last part of the slide, we see a lone person uh, who was reducing their nitrogen, or excuse me, reducing their fertilizer rates uh, pretty significantly, um, close to, you know, $50 an acre. Um, and this is probably, this is somebody, I looked into it, uh, who uh, was uh, growing a leguminous cover crop after a small grain and, and actually reducing their nitrogen rates. Uh, to the following corn crop. And so you need an extended rotation for that, but if you're growing your own cover crop seed, that's a really great way to do that. Okay, I'm going to end polling now. Okay, so the question was, how have you cut expenses of cash crop production with cover crops? And we let people um, mark more than one. So it looks like 21 people are nearly 30% are reducing uh, the amount of tillage that they're uh, using on their fields after a cover crop. That's really great. Um, and we also see that about 14 or 20% are reducing herbicide products and 11% um, are reducing herbicide passes. I'd love to hear more about how specifically you're doing that when we uh, open up the chat box later on. And um, uh, 11 people were reducing fertilizer rates. I would also like to hear a little bit more about that. And uh, about 50% of people said that the question is not applicable to them. So thank you for participating in that. That's great to hear that um, folks are changing their practices a bit. All right, so in addition to changing uh, crop production practices, some people were actually able to gain additional revenue back from their crop fields via livestock feed. And so, uh, Sarah, you can go ahead and share the third and final poll now. Uh, sorry if you're experiencing any poll fatigue, I promise this is the last one. Um, but as you can see by the graph, uh, from the graph, there's quite a bit of variability in um, the grazing value of cover crops. So just to explain this graph a little bit, on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, you can see the number of people who responded um, to any given category, and then on the x-axis, this is the feed value of their cover crop um, without including feed or application costs. So this is not a partial budget. This is just, um, you know, ways that they're able to cut feeding expenses from their livestock. Um, and so, as you can see, there's a ton of variability. You know, some folks were probably um, grazing uh, in the fall, in the spring, and maybe they were using heavier seeding rates, um, multi-species in the fall and they were able to get over uh, $100 an acre uh, from, from that uh, cover crop raising revenue. But most people were getting somewhere between uh, 35 and 55, and I could have put these into smaller bins, but um, most people are kind of leaning toward that uh, upper part of, of that range in the 35 to 55. So 
if folks are uh, grazing, grazing their cover crops, typically they're very easily recouping the value of uh, the feeding application cost. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. Hopefully everyone's voted. The question was, have you ever grazed cover crops? And 16 people said yes. Um, 13 people said no, but I'd like to. Curious to hear if they just don't have livestock or if they haven't found the opportunity yet. We can talk about that later as well. And then six people said no, and I'm not really interested in grazing cover crops. And uh, 32 people said that it's not applicable to them. Um, so these are probably our, our practitioners and non-farmers. Um, thank you for participating in that. All right, so to kind of get to the, to the core of our, of our talk here, um, what was the overall impact of using cover crops in uh, farmer systems? Um, this is the partial budget of cover crops ahead of soybeans. And we had a histogram with different observations, but it was sort of hard to understand and sort of hard to look at as a bit of an eyesore. And so I simplified this um, into a probability distribution. And so to uh, interpret this, um, you can interpret this as the higher the peak on the graph, um, the more people who sell into that particular range of the partial budget. And I've also identified the mean or, or excuse me, the average or the median um, with these uh, solid lines here. And so the blue distribution is people that were not using cover crops for grazing or forage. Um, our, our median here was about $29 an acre, uh, negative $29 an acre, and that for the most part is just you know, people that are spending money on seed and application costs but weren't actually uh, recouping, uh, weren't taking advantage of, of any of those cost saving practices that we've been outlining. Um, however, something that was really cool for me to see was you'll have to get your reader, uh, reader glasses out here, but um, there are actually a few people, uh, our zero is here, there are actually a few people who fell to the right of the zero, which meant that uh, cover crops was a net positive practice for them, um, despite not uh, grazing or, or harvesting uh, for forage. So that was really promising to me. It's not a ton of people, but these are probably folks that are reducing their tillage or reducing herbicide passes. Another kind of interesting thing is that um, from negative 10 to zero, there are also a good chunk of, of folks that fall into this category. And um, we uh, are excited about this because we know that because they responded to our survey, they are participating in our cover crop cost share program. And so they're getting $10 an acre. And so with the cost share, they would actually be bumped in, into that net positive range. And so it's kind of promising to me to see see the impacts, but we also see that, you know, we, um, we at PFI need to do a better job of working with farmers to make sure that they're not falling into this um, kind of nasty, uh, uh, losing a, a lot of money range. Now, the green distribution is uh, if people were grazing cover crops, and so the median on this is a positive $30 an acre, and so this, this is a partial budget. Um, so um, this is after seed and application costs and any other costs that were associated with uh, cover cropping and grazing cover cropping. Most people were having a net positive $30 an acre. But again, there's a lot of variability in this. And um, you know, we were seeing people that uh, reported getting a net positive of over $100 an acre on this, which was really cool too. Um, but I do want to include uh, just because we didn't want to make the survey extremely long, we didn't ask a ton of questions on. Uh, labor and fencing expenses, and so that was not reported. So you'd have to, if you're thinking about how to use this on your farm, you'd also have to think about, you know, um, how much money you're going to spend on, on labor, moving the cattle and moving, uh, getting water access or um, fencing. All right, and then, um, oops, I didn't advance here. Okay, and the red distribution is when folks were cutting their cover crop uh, for forage. So this is typically when it was an overwintering cover crop. I, we saw folks that were doing uh, uh, rylage, zero rye silage, uh, triticale silage, um, triticale uh, straw and hay. Um, and we didn't necessarily anticipate that a lot of folks in our cost share program were actually utilizing the cover crop for um, forage or for silage. And so 
Um, we didn't necessarily ask uh, a ton of detailed questions on this. It was more open-ended. But what we found was that the median was a positive $92 an acre on this. Um, and again, there's a lot of variability and there are quite a few people who are making, um, or there are about half of the people who are making significantly more than that $92 an acre on um, cutting that cover crop for forage or silage. Um, and I just want to include, I've got this note here, um, since this is self-reported, we don't necessarily know if people were including um, some of the mowing and baling costs. And we uh, came up with an estimate of about 60, uh, 62, $63 on this. So you can imagine this entire curve could be plus or minus 62, $63. And we don't exactly know how people were calculating um, those revenue streams when they were reporting them to us. And so we also did uh, partial budgets for cover crop ahead of corn. Um, and it's a pretty similar distribution. And so I just wanted to show you the graph and I'll pause for a second so you can look at it. And if you've got any questions, we could delve into it deeper. Um, but because they're really similar to the cover crop, um, cover crop soy partial budgets, I didn't necessarily feel like we needed to delve super deep into them. So I'll just pause for a second and, and folks can take a look. All right, so I'm going to move on to our conclusions here. Um, what we found from surveys, from the survey results and also from just chatting with farmers who are making cover crops pay on their farm, is that cover crops can be a net positive practice if uh, we're utilizing the cover crops for feed, whether that's grazing or for some sort of forage or silage. Um, or uh, cover crops can be a net positive practice if producers are saving costs in other areas, such as herbicide reduction or emitting tillage. And so those were those uh, a few people in the blue on the uh, soybean partial budgets who are above zero. Likewise, cover crops can be a break-even practice um, if cover crops can be a break-even or a net positive practice if um, our cover crop fields are experiencing revenue increases of above. $29, so that's again our median seed and seeding cost. And so to get that um, revenue increases of above $29 an acre, that would mean with current prices, um, that'd mean yielding about 15 bushel an acre, uh, a 15 bushel an acre increase in corn, which is not super likely. We haven't seen a lot of results in um, that grade of, of yield, yield spikes from year to year in corn, though it could be a long-term effect of, of maybe uh, maintaining the yield instead of it dropping when we've got uh, adverse climate conditions. And likewise, uh, another more realistic option is if folks are able to yield uh, four, uh, three to four bushel an acre um, additionally in soy than what they would usually yield. Um, and so this is something that actually is uh, very possible and we've seen uh, people who are experiencing you know, two to three to four bushel an increase in, uh, in soy. Um, and so this is really promising to me that, you know, if we're getting that yield boost from uh, cover cropping our soy fields because we're getting benefits from water retention, weed suppression, um, that sort of thing, then um, people can very easily recoup the cost of that $29 an acre. And then likewise, cover crops can be a net positive or break-even practice if cost share is provided, which is something that, you know, we're continuing to work uh, on with both private and public entities. And of course, um, even if we can't make it a break even or a net positive practice, practice we can at least get cover crops to cost less um, by you know, being really intentional about our seed and application costs and reducing those if we don't have really specific goals and if we're not thinking about ways that we are going to reduce those costs later on. Um, or if, if producers can save costs in other areas, um, cover crops can cost less as well. Um, just so some of the low hanging fruit that I see uh, in the next couple of years that we should really be pushing for and trying to trying to do on our own farms and working with our neighbors to do is um, starting with cereal rye ahead of soybeans. Um, cereal rye is cereal rye seed is relatively cheap and it's uh, really readily available throughout the state nowadays. And it's not as tricky to manage as cereal rye ahead of corn, which can cause a lot of issues with nitrogen tie up. Um, additionally, folks that were um, using cereal rye ahead of soybean, like I've already said, have observed decreased uh, weed pressure, and typically there are um, uh, 
the yield impact is neutral to positive. And so it's a really low risk thing. Very few people um, experience yield decreases with zero uh, or I ahead of, of soybeans. And then the second low-hanging fruit that I see is that we need to get uh, folks with livestock to start grazing, uh, start using cover crops for grazing. Uh, a farmer that I chatted with last winter from Grinnell area said that it's a no-brainer. You know, like, why aren't more people out there? If you've got livestock, why aren't you grazing cover crops? It's a really easy way to reduce your feed and forage um, costs. And so um, our cattle are saying instead of uh, eat more chicken, they're now saying grow more cover crops. And then finally, I just want to um, thank the folks who contributed uh, to this presentation and to the study. Uh, Wendy and Swidago from Auburn University um, was extremely helpful in kind of sorting through some of the economic stuff. And then from TFI, Sarah Carlson, Megan Silver, Lily English, and Alicia Bauer are all uh, extremely helpful in this as well. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now so you can't see all the, the different chats that are coming in. I'm not sure how much of this you can see. Sarah, do you want to, I can't hear you, but do you want to maybe start um, telling me what's coming in through the chat yep. box? Yeah, so one of the first comments, uh, Rick Jukum made a good comment. He just said, you don't get that growth off of cover crops if you're applying late with fall fertilizer, even though fall fertilizer application would be a very cheap way to get it out. Um, and so Rick mentions, you know, if you're going to apply manure as your nitrogen source and not use fall fertilizer, uh, it's not as easy to mix cover crop seed uh, with that manure. Um, and so maybe Becca, could you mention about uh, those cost ranges for farmers who were using like aerial application or that high boy um, to get that earlier seeding date? What was our range on that cost? Yeah, Rick, that's a that's a really great point and I'm glad that you brought that up. You're not getting as much growth if you're seeding much later, so you might have to increase um, seeding application rate. But, um, you know, for aerial application, I saw a lot of variability when I was just waiting through the data. Um, typically, it was at least $15 an acre. Sometimes it was even up to, you know, $23, $24 an acre. Um, and so, you know, that's absolutely an issue, or that's absolute, absolutely an option of getting the cover crops uh, seeded early. I've just heard, you know, depending on what your goals are, if you're hoping for weed suppression and you want a really good stand, maybe aerially seeding isn't always the best option because it's kind of more difficult for the, for the airplane to get that on really evenly. And then in terms of uh, high boy seeding uh, costs, I think I saw closer to, you know, $15, $20 an acre range on that. Um, we could pull up specific numbers um, if folks are, are really interested in that, in that question. But that's another really good way to get our seed on earlier, um, but it's a little bit more accurate and precise than airplane seeding. You can get it. You'll have better luck with getting it um, to the ground that you want to be covered. That Great. Was, thanks, Rick, for, for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Olson uh, brings up a good point. He's thinking of seeding under the corn head while combining by putting on some sort of uh, attachment, like a Gandy box or a, a Valmar, uh, you know, seeder box on that combine platform. We've seen Graceland University uh, with Montag has created the drill combine. Um, so Becca, I don't know if we had a lot of farmers mentioning that they were uh, co-combining and applying seed at the same time in our responses. It wasn't something that came up that I saw very frequently. Um, I've thought about this too, Jeff, the, the Yetter uh, Devastator. I think that'd be a really good way to just uh, break up the, uh, I guess our corn residue enough that we could actually get a little bit more uh, seed to soil contact if we did something like that. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard of people doing that, but I think that's a really good point of um, that'd be a really great way to save money on uh, on diesel and uh, reduce the number of passes that we're making on our field. So if you end up doing that, I would love to see photos of it. I think you've got my email, so uh, send us some photos so we can see, see it and learn more. 
Great. Mark uh, from Montag uh, was sharing a number of different uh, equipment designs uh, that Montag has been releasing uh, with a number of partners. So they've partnered on the Graceland University uh, drill combine. Um, they've also been partnering with John Deere and Heggie Manufacturing on ways to just incorporate their uh, seed delivery system with multiple pieces of equipment. Um, they've also tested out these uh, cultivators to do interseeding. Um, so it sounds like, uh, Becca, you know, if we want to save on that application cost, any way that we can combine that path with something else that we're doing, whether it's dry fertilizer or maybe we're going through the field for some other reason, um, it seems like we did see farmers really trying to reduce that application cost by combining it. And Montag would be a good opportunity, a good, a good business to look towards if folks are looking to take that even further. Okay, so uh, another question that came up was, who pays for the cover crop? So between landowners and tenants, um, I don't know, in our discussions, Becca, when you've been on the phone with a lot of farmers, what have you been hearing from uh, farmers who are tenants about how they have that relationship with their landlord, or landlord and who pays for the cover crop? Yeah, um, that's a good question. There's a lot of variability. I was chatting with somebody, um, a couple of weeks ago who was brand new to cover crops and um i said you know why why do you want to do cover crops and uh he's like oh, i don't i don't really know my landlord told me that i should do them and, and so i'm going to do it and so um he was actually taking on the cost himself you know especially for the first couple of years uh nrcs cost share programs are extremely helpful and of course they're uh, privately funded cost share programs as well um but i uh, I think it really varies. It seems like a lot of times the producers are uh, paying for, for the cover crop uh, with a few exceptions. Um, I think, you know, if I were a landowner, I think that would be something that I would really be prioritizing as just a way to safeguard my investment of land. If I want to continue to get high cash rent, I really need to be um, conserving my soil uh, so that I can continue to have a high CSR2 uh, value in the future so that I can continue to charge rent at a rate that would be um, profitable to me. And so um, I think that's something that, you know, you could really work with your landlord on is maybe splitting the cost if you're renting. Um, but, you know, as some of this data showed, since we're able to get some direct economic uh, uh, benefits of weed suppression, it could be something that maybe um, the producer takes on themselves, even if they're not really worried about soil conservation as much. There's still reasons to do that um, just for weed suppression. Great. Dale mentions that he's eliminated a fungicide application to corn and soybeans, and he's also seen great late season health in his crops. He's limited his use of insecticides and seed treatments, and he's gonna evaluate over the next uh, few years. So Becca, just if you remember in the data, you know, did we have a lot of farmers saying that they were cutting some of the fungicides, insecticides, seed treatment, um, or is there still room for coaching there? Um, hi, Dale. Good to see you. Good to see you on the on the call. Um, I hadn't heard much of that. In fact, um, when it came to fungicide, I think I heard of a, a few people who were uh, spending a little bit more on fungicide application in beans after using a cover crop. I think it's going to depend a lot on the year of you know, how much moisture we're getting uh, to uh, to our crop fields if we're going to have uh, higher rates of fungal issues. Um, I, yeah, I haven't heard of, of people doing that. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, was that a shift that you did on all your entire farm or was that something that you did um, on just your cover crop acres? Um, and I wonder if that's, you know, it could have something to do with the rotation effect of, you know, if we've got different species out there, they might be breaking up um, some of our pest cycles um, in ways that we can't exactly explain yet. Um, and so that's really cool. I mean, I think cover crops provide a, a good um, habitat for some of our beneficial uh, fungi and, and insects. And so, you know, if we've got a, a really good uh, population of beneficials out there, then they're gonna be helping us to fight those, uh, those pests. Uh, uh, pest insects and, and pest uh, fungal issues. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's definitely potential for that. I didn't see a, a lot of that in, in our survey responses. 
Gail also has a follow-up comment that I think is just good uh, advice. Being deliberate about how you start with using cover crops is important, and then util utilizing various cautious opportunities will help minimize the risk to the producer as they get started. So great points, uh, Dale. Okay, another person asked, is there a rule of thumb for pounds of nitrogen that should be added to corn starter after X tons or height or size of rye biomass? It's a great question. I'm gonna let you take that one, Sarah. I feel like you're <laughs> a bit more of an expert on, on that. So I'd say there's still a lot of research to be done. Um, when, our, when our soils are warm, and if we're delaying our corn planting just a little bit and we can get that corn out of the ground very quickly, we probably don't need to add a bunch of nitrogen starter um, to the planter. But when our soils are cooler um, and the rye is maybe over eight inches to 12 inches tall and that corn seed may sit there for a little bit longer than we'd like, um, we wanna help it get out of the ground as quick as possible to avoid seedling diseases. And so we may need to be putting on an, uh, not an extra 30 to 40 pounds of nitrogen at application, but moving that nitrogen from a fall anhydrous or spring anhydrous application and move it to the starting uh, starter time period um, in a two by two or two zero by two application, just to help that corn get out of the ground as fast as possible to avoid those seedling diseases um, and also offset any of that nitrogen that's really tied up in that residue um, and slowly breaking down just because it's cold in April. Um, so we have started seeing farmers switch and plant soybeans first and, and plant corn second, um, just when we follow cover crops, just to help it get out of the ground faster and avoid a lot of those issues uh, with nitrogen tie up. Uh, another uh, person asked, curious about, curious about how to connect with someone to graze my cover crop. Thoughts on that? Excellent. Background? Yeah, um, Megan uh, Silbert on our staff is kind of our in-house grazing cover crop expert and she's been working with folks from a couple other organizations to develop the i believe it's called the midwest grazing collaborative um, and if you can access their website which i believe is um, going to be online very soon i think it, it was supposed to come out this september um, you can if you're somebody who has livestock and you want to graze cover crops because you see the, the nutritional value of it you can uh, search for people who uh, have cover crop fields um, and if you um, are somebody who has cover cropped fields and would like to get a little bit of you know, diversity in, in the microbiome of what's going on in the soil, um, you could also contact uh, folks that have, have livestock to do that. Um, yeah, so that's one way that I know. I think you could also just chat with you know, your neighbors and um, see if there's anybody out there who uh, would like to do that. I've heard of, you know, we're, we're talking about economics and finances in, in this presentation specifically, and so I'll also just mention that um, it seems like most people aren't charging for contract grazing or custom grazing. Um, however, I think if you um, seed your cover crop early and have a lot of biomass out there, there have been a couple cases of people who are charging for contact, uh, contract or custom grazing. Um, there's somebody in, in southern Iowa who I think was charging uh, 75 cents or maybe it was a dollar per head per day uh, for grazing and so that's just something that you could also discuss with whoever you you end up connecting with um, for grazing your cover crops but I think you know uh, cattlemen and cattlewomen definitely uh, see the value uh, nutritionally in, in grazing cover crops and so I think you know you should be able to find somebody especially if you're willing to work with them on fencing and access to water. Yeah, and another revenue source that Brian uh, Sievers mentioned is that he's harvesting uh, some of that cover crop biomass to add to his anaerobic digester that he has on his farm. And so that's a whole nother opportunity, um, not, not putting the rye through a rumen, uh, but putting it through anaerobic digestion for energy uh, production that, you know, maybe one day uh, we could see cover crops used uh, for those sorts of uh, cash revenue. So I see some uh, sharing of application costs in the chat. Um, and so folks can keep sharing what they're seeing. Um, I see the Bardoles are, are promoting, they have a business over in Green County and they're also available for high boy seating. Um, and so you all can uh, sort of see each other there and, and connect. Um, and so another question came up was, uh, what, are we, what are we seeing with armyworm pressure? And do we see farmers adding an insecticide pass 
to that cornfield after a rye cover crop every year due to armyworms or armyworm sort of spotties. So anything in the data there, Becca, that we that we see. Um, we, um, Sarah, I feel like you should probably take this one again. Um, that wasn't something that was mentioned specifically in this year. We were asking about management from uh, 2018, and I, I believe, from my understanding, um, army worm wasn't a, a huge issue in 2018. Um, it's definitely something that people have experienced in the past, and so you know, something that you need to be scouting for absolutely because it, it can be um, something that has a negative impact to to your corn. Um, Sarah, do you want to add any more on that? Uh, you got to scout. Go scout. See what size those army worms are. If they are bigger than like this part of your finger, basically bigger than an inch, um, they're mostly past their life cycle, and so it's probably not worth it to make a insecticide application. Um, but if they're smaller, it's probably financially worth it um, to spray for them. You cannot control army worms with an insecticide put in furrow. They have to be applied uh, after they've emerged. So do not spend the money on an, an uh, insecticide in furrow. Uh, somebody else asked about how can I avoid too much compaction uh, if I'm going to be grazing those cover crops and I'm no-till. Um, and so I'll just I'll offer real quick, and then Becca, if you want to follow up with any other advice, um, we can't uh, forget good grazing management if we're going to graze in the spring and we are no-till or even strip-till. So, you know, through the March window, we're probably okay uh, grazing those covers, but when things start to get a little sloppy, uh, we might need to have a sacrifice area where we move cattle off, and when the moisture gets out of the soil and the conditions are right, you know, then move those cattle back on onto that cover crop. So we still have to do good grazing management, um, but we can take advantage of a lot of growth in the spring uh, when we put our cattle out on those cover crops because of its growth, you know, just logarithmically going crazy in the spring. Um, so Becca, I don't know if there's anything else in that grazing cover crop uh, data that we saw, but it looks like it's a win-win yeah. if people can manage it right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a um, that's a good question, Chris, and, and a really important thing to avoid uh, damage to our, to our falling crop. Um, other pieces of advice that I've heard is to make sure that you keep adequate residue out there. So um, not letting your cattle graze it all the way down to the soil surface, uh, leaving at least a couple inches out um, uh, on the field to kind of help protect against uh, that pugging, that compaction. Um, another important thing is just to monitor your uh, your water source areas. It's kind of intuitive, but if you can have, you know, uh, counterintuitive, but if you can have your water source kind of higher up on the landscape on a drier area, you're going to be less likely to have, you know, your cattle plugging through uh, really wet soil that's that's uh, lower lying that uh, could cause compaction. Um, so I think those are, are the main things in addition to, to what Sarah said and just like being really diligent in the spring, being willing to you know, move them to a sacrifice area and, and have a, a small sacrifice area. Uh, another really great question is just, you know, when is the best time to be seeding cover crops after corn and soybeans? Uh, Jeff Olson mentioned, you know, his pilot just showed up. Uh, so we have farmers right now that are putting it on with airplanes and with high boys into sanding crop. And we're we're almost through that overseeding application window, maybe in the next week or so, uh, you know, as farmers start to harvest crops, we're probably done overseeding cover crops. But after harvest, what's our best time that we should really be getting those cover crops on? As soon as possible. Uh, you know, the sooner that you're able to get your cover crop seeded, the more growth you're going to get on in the fall. And so um, the you're going to have increased tillering um, on that cover crop in the spring and um, have, you know, more plants, have a higher plant population, more biomass um, per acre. So, you know, if you've got the, if you've got the labor, we've definitely heard of farmers uh, and, and families and neighbors who are working together um, who are literally following the combine with whatever sort of seeding method that they're using. Um, and so, yeah, the, the sooner that you can get your cover crop seed out there, the better. I, I really don't see um, any, I guess, I guess, like, you know, you wouldn't want to get it out uh, so early that if, you, if you're seeding into a standing crop, uh, 
Let's see, did you say after harvest? So if you're seeding into a standing crop, you want to make sure that um, your uh, crop is starting, your cash crop is starting to senesce so that that cover crop seed is going to germinate, but still also get adequate sunlight uh, reaching that cover crop so that it can continue to grow and isn't kind of choked out by the sunlight. So um, if you're, yeah, if you're seeding into standing, a uh, standing crop, uh, look for uh, senescence uh, or when, when your leaves are starting to turn uh, or black layer for corn. Um, and then otherwise, just as soon as possible, you're going to get uh, way more benefits. And then uh, a couple other questions have just been about where can I find a grain drill to rent? Uh, most implement dealers don't have them in my area. Are there farmer to farm rental agreements? Um, so I've posted in the chat box our cover crop business directory that is not exhaustive. Uh, we love to receive uh, notices about those startup cover crop businesses so we can put them on the directory. Um, one thing I'll mention um, before Becky, you could talk a little bit more about uh, implements is just we are d designing right now actually an app where you could go onto the app to find local businesses that offer plain uh, application services or that high by service or custom drilling or even like a VT um, you know, with maybe a Montag box or some sort of spinner spreader application so that we can find the equipment. And then also those seed dealers that are out there, um, we're calling it Uber for cover crops, if anybody even understands what that means. Um, but, you know, just how can we find those businesses near us, uh, geolocated? Um, but in the meantime, we at least have our cover crop business directory. And, and Tyler and others, you know, email PFI. If you can't find the equipment, like this spring, for example, when we had the, this spring, in August, excuse me, when we had the derecho impact, um, we definitely had farmers looking for uh, roller crimpers to be able to size some of that residue. And we were able to hook up a couple farmers with roller crimpers within our network. Um, so if you're looking for equipment, definitely uh, email uh, Becca or I, uh, and we can help connect you. So on that equipment slide, Becca, um, it seems like that fall fertilizer application is probably the cheapest way to go uh, to get it out, but it is post harvest. Uh, can you just remind folks again, what was that fall fertilizer application uh, average cost? Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head and it really varied. Um, we saw some people whose co-ops actually weren't charging additional at all to add their cover crop seed. And so, you know, their cover crop expenses were essentially just the seed itself, which was really cool to me. Um, I chatted with somebody, yes, uh, a couple of days ago about, um, you know, they're getting it for a dollar or, or somewhere between a dollar and two dollars um, per acre. Um, and kind of the high range that I've been seeing on that was closer to four or five dollars. Um, another good way to um, kind of save on application costs similar to, you know, coupling it with the fall fertilizer is if you were to add um, an air seeder to, uh, to your vertical tillage implement. If you're out there doing any sort of uh, vertical tillage anyway, um, just adding a, you know, a candy box or some sort of air seeder on there is um, a good way to keep your cost low um, and reduce the number of passes across the field. Great. Well, our time has come uh, to, to stop this great discussion. Um, I really appreciate all the comments in the chat box. Uh, this has been recorded, and so it'll be available uh, for you to go back and watch if you want to. Um, and I really just want to uh, thank Becca for putting in a lot of work uh, to pull this study together and for all the farmers uh, who filled out that survey uh, so that we could really find out, you know, where are we at? Uh, where are there places where we can keep saving? Where can we save more? And how can we really make cover crops uh, pay in the short term so that we can see more farmers using it and getting those benefits to soil health, weed control, um, grazing, you know, and just growing better corn and soybeans. So uh, thanks, Becca, uh, for uh, sharing all this data with us today. And thanks, everybody, who were on uh, the webinar. And I wish you a great rest of your day and be safe uh, as most of you are starting harvest. Thank you.